Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Namaste so this is the second video in the series on Karma Yoga in Bhagavad Gita. And in this video, we're going to go over some of the reasons why Karma Yoga is absolutely necessary to spiritual life. I mean, we see in the lives of great saints and sages that they continue to perform seva. Seva means service. And they perform this seva in a mood of devotion, even though technically there's no need for it. But they do it for two reasons. One is to show a good example. Their students should follow the example and also perform seva to worship uh, the Absolute, the God, and also to benefit the humanity. For example, Ramana Maharshi, he made his whole life public. He lived in, a, in an open shed, at least in the beginning of his public life. After 10, 12 years of deep sadhana in the cave of Virupaksha, even then he was surrounded by, you know, 20 devotees or something like that. But then when he came down and established his mother's samadhi, then he opened his whole life and people could come and would come at any time and ask him questions. And he had a very interesting way of receiving these questions. He would listen, and then he would pause, sometimes for a long time. And if the questioner or another questioner asked another question, he would just drop it. He wouldn't reply to the first question. But if the questioner waited, then Ramana would give the answer. And he said one time, actually, the silence is the answer. And the verbal reply is just to satisfy the mind. But anyway, his teaching was his karma yoga. And he also used to cook in the kitchen for all the devotees, and he had the ability to create the most delicious dishes, even from so-called useless plants, things that nobody else would dream of cooking. He would cook, and it would be delicious. And not only that, it was medicinal. You know, one time, Srila Prabhupada, my Adi Guru, was on a walk, morning walk, in a rural location in India. And the uh, devotees were talking about the weeds, that there were many weeds growing on the path, and that they should replace them with flowers or something like that. And Prabhupada stopped. What do you mean weeds? Oh, Prabhupada, those are useless plants. And he said, no plant is useless. Simply, you do not know the application. So we see that karma, which is the use of useful things in the service of God and the devotees, is not something lower to be given up as one becomes more advanced. <laughs> no. That's it. That's an egoistic point of view. But karma yoga is the foundation 
the basis for all the higher yogas, and it should never be given up. Doing these videos, for example, is my karma yoga. I have no need to do them. I don't benefit from them, except, of course, from the good karma and the blessings <laughs> that I get from the appreciative watchers. But still, I really have no intrinsic need to do these videos, but I do them as a matter of service. So, uh, what does Bhagavad Gita say about this? Let's begin reading some verses. Sanyasana Deva Siddhing Samadhi Gachati. Not by merely abstaining from work can one achieve freedom from reaction, nor by renunciation alone can one attain perfection. So let's look into these two related but actually quite different statements. One cannot stop karmic reaction by simply uh, ceasing to work. Some people think that simply by renunciation, in other words, stopping all fruit of work, work meant to attain some results, that the karma will go away. But this isn't true. As we discussed last time, there are three types of karma. The karma from previous lives that's in abeyance, waiting for the proper situation. The ripened karma, prarabdha karma, that's due in this life and appropriate for the situation one is in. And finally, there's the future karma, which is generated from the actions performed in this life. So in other words, Simply stopping one's work in this life does not stop the karma that's already ripe, that was created in previous lives. In fact, even an enlightened person is going to experience that karma, that prarabdha karma, although the other classifications of karma are destroyed by attaining enlightenment. So, simply by renunciation, one cannot achieve freedom. In other words, one has to work. But one's work should bring one to liberation, should create the karma that results in receiving the blessing of moksha. How did this work? Well, Later on, we'll talk about the three modes of material nature, goodness, satya guna, passion, rajoguna, and ignorance, tamoguna. And of the three, the satya guna is considered highest. The reason for this is actions performed in satya guna lead toward liberation. So satya or sattva means goodness. It also means truth, eternity, purity, and so many similar things. So those actions which are pure are those uh, from which one is not expecting any return, any profit, any result. And this is the characteristic of karma yoga. Karma yoga is not performed in the mood of selfish gain. Karma yoga is actions offered to the Supreme in any form. So whether one worships Krishna or Rama or Devi or Shakti or Brahman or Buddha or even Jesus, <laughs> if one performs 
his activities as an offering, knowing that it will be uh, a pleasing offering to that particular form of God, then that action is karma yoga and it brings no karmic reaction, either in this life or in future lives. Now, some people asked about rituals. And religious rituals are also part of karma yoga. And we described those in a previous series, Introduction to Karma Yoga, and also in another series, Spiritual Nourishment. Now, these rituals are part of the Vedic tradition. And also we find them in Buddha's teaching, in the Buddhist tradition, both North and South Buddhism. And someone asked, well, is it really appropriate for Westerners to use these forms? And my answer to this is, well, if you don't use those forms, what forms are you going to use? <laughs> because in the West, the tradition of offering things to God has completely broken down. There is no Western tradition that I'm aware of that facilitates offering everything to God as service. Correct me if I'm wrong. There may be some obscure tradition, perhaps one of the Wiccan traditions or something like that. Uh, and certainly in the Native American traditions, there are offerings to God but they're only partial. Incense, candles, some prayers and stuff like that, hymns. But nowhere is a method given by which one can offer one's entire life and energy to the Supreme. And this is the standard. This is what's necessary because actually karma yoga is not just a series of actions. Karma yoga is ultimately an attitude, an attitude of service to the Supreme. And this attitude is the seed of the next higher level of bhakti. See, when one purifies the mind, the body, and one's life and surroundings and so on, by continuously offering food, incense, water, flowers, lamps, and, and so many other things, huh? one's work, one's money, one's family, one's possessions, and all activities in life. Then gradually, one develops a sense of relationship with God. I am the servant and God is the master. I am making the offering, and God is receiving the offering. So this is called Dasya Ras. Dasya Ras is the mood of service to the Supreme. And this is the root of Bhakti Yoga. So, as we've explained so many times, when Karma Yoga matures, it spontaneously leads to bhakti yoga, the next higher stage in the four yogas. And of course, the same is true of bhakti. It leads to meditation. And when meditation is mature, that becomes enlightenment itself. But the foundation is there in karma yoga. And one should never give up this process of offering to the Supreme because this is the foundation that leads to ultimate enlightenment and liberation. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.